Amen. Thank you, Wanda, for playing for us tonight. If you have your Bible close at hand, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. We've been on First and Second Thessalonians for a little bit, and uh, it's been a really good study. And now I'm also considering what will be for uh, our next study. And uh, interesting enough, it kind of occurred to me that the next Sunday is, you know, of course, Resurrection Sunday or Easter, whatever how you want to say it. I decided that what we're going to do next Sunday is, is start a series on Christ through the Old Testament. And so just seeing the different things about typology, different things about uh, prophecy, th different things about um, uh, the instances where the angel of the Lord is specifically Christ in the Old Testament. So it's going to be a, a wonderful study. So looking forward to that. Tonight we're going to finish up the Thessalonians. And uh, we'll see what uh, the Lord has in store for us. We're starting verse number one. We'll just read the whole chapter. It says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil and we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you uh, to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, and we'll see what the Lord has for us in our passage tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us t this time together to learn from your word. May you use your word in our lives to help us, to encourage us, knowing that the day is coming when Christ will soon appear. We ask you to help us to be heavenly-minded. We ask you to help us to, uh, to not to seek the things that are here on earth below, but rather seek things which are above. And we thank you so much for our, our great hope, which is in Christ. And Father, we ask you to bless this time together. And I do pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to do something very unconventional. On May 30th, 2022. Mark your calendars. Jesus is coming back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we talked about last week <laughs> how uh, I, I cringe whenever somebody says, okay, I know exactly when Jesus is coming back. Well, the Bible says we don't. So, uh, But think about it with me. If it was on May 30th, 2022, what if it was? Okay, 
I'm not, no, don't stone me, I'm not a prophet or, or a son of a prophet. Um, but if it was, would you do, and this is a question just for you to ponder, not to say anything out loud, okay? So this is just thinking through. If we knew exactly when Christ would be back, would your life change dramatically or would you do the same things you've been doing? That's a good question that we have to think through. If you knew that Christ was coming on May 30th, 2022, and the reason why I picked May 30th is anniversary. <laughs> uh, me and Laura's anniversary got married uh, uh, almost 13 years ago, so wonderful. And you know, m- most people say, ah, you're just, you're just a kid. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's great. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, going to our 70th wedding anniversary at some point in time in the future, um, if the Lord tarries, of course. But we think about it. If we knew for, for sure that it was going to be at a future date, a specific date, if we say, okay, well, now I'm going to really live for God, then there's a problem with what we're doing now. If we say, oh, no, I'm really going to be a witness now, well, there's a problem because you're not being the witness you ought to be now. Well, if you, well, well for sure we don't know when he's coming. That's true. He could come before I finish this sermon. He could come sooner than anybody ever predicted, like in the next hour or so. He can come back. And there is no doubt in my mind that he is coming back, and he will come at a time where no one is expecting him. And so many people will be caught off guard. But the trick for us to understand, to think about, is what are we doing for Christ here and now? What are we doing for Christ this next week? What are we doing for Christ this next month? If we say to ourselves, well, I want to be ready at his coming. I don't want to be ashamed with how I've been living. If you have been living in a way that's contrary to seeing Christ and saying, oh, I I should have cleaned that up. I should have have done this more. I should have prayed more. I should have read my Bible more or, or whatever. Whatever it is that we might change, we ought to do. And we have to do more and more. In the Chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, Paul gives three specifics for the church of Thessalonica to make notice, to think about as they prepare for the coming of the Lord. The church of Thessalonica is a very unique church. For those who weren't with us for all the the different things, I've talked about this church for a while. Um, But for those who weren't with us, we've been through Thessalonica, and Thessalonica was a great church. It was a fantastic church, though it was, it was forged in the midst of persecution. Paul he taught as many weeks as he could, but eventually the city would thrust him out. And so the believers in the city told him, you need to leave because persecution is getting intense. And so he does. He left, he, he left with Silas as well as uh, Timotheus, and they hit the road. And so Paul's always concerned about a church after he leaves if he taught them and if they have stumbled away from the faith. And so he then writes to the church of Thessalonica to see, or he sends Timothy back to Thessalonica to see what has happened since he's left. He only went through halfway of what he usually does. He usually spends about six weeks at a certain location planting a church and then he moves on. In that six weeks, he teaches everything they ought to know as to the Christian faith. But he only spent three weeks there, so half the time. So he was concerned for those believers in Thessalonica as to whether or not he has labored in vain. And we talked about that in First Thessalonians. And he sent Timothy. Timothy went to the church, was very encouraged by what the believers were like, and they went back. And he said, oh, this is great. The believers are doing well, and they're being very prosperous. They're being very fruitful in their lives and for Christ. And, and uh, they do have some questions, though. And so he addressed the questions about the, well, rapture of the church. He talked about that. About a few other discussions about uh, uh, what they were wondering about. But uh, he set the record straight in First Thessalonians. But then... Somebody decided to write a forger document in Paul's name, send it to the church, 
and I was full of wrong things. So they were confused. Okay, well, he said this over here in our book of 1 Thessalonians, but over here is another epistle that he wrote, and this is, this is odd. This is weird. He contradicts himself. And so seeing and understanding that there were false teachers around about the area, Paul then writes another letter very quickly after the first. About a month or so later, he writes this, this book of 2 Thessalonians to make sure, okay, this is me talking. This is what we actually should believe. And talking about, okay, am I going through the tribulation right now? He answers the question, chapter 2. And says, no, it's not the tribulation time. It's going to be when there's a taking away of the church, away from, and we talked about that, and and from the world, and then the Antichrist will come. And at that point in time, there will be a strong delusion where people will not get saved who would not believe on Christ in the midst of the tribulation time. We talked about that. So now, when talking about this last chapter, there's also an issue that came up. Well, if Jesus is coming back soon, and we all know it, I don't need to work. No, I, I, I can let the church take care of me. Ah, that would be good. I don't have to work. I can quit my job, and uh, everything will be easy. And uh, we're waiting for the Lord to come. Yeah, we, we are looking forward to his soon come. Yeah, he's going to come. Um, So I'm just going to relax, not work, and just just chill. Okay. Paul has some very harsh uh, commands against him. So we're going to be looking at that and uh, talking about the different things that Paul says for the church of Thessalonica to do as they are waiting for Christ's soon return. So notice with me, first of all, we're going to see, number one, that he advises the church to pray for uh, the ministry. Pray for the ministry. Number one, notice with me in verse number one and verse number two. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. The Apostle Paul is always concerned about going from place to place to place to preach the gospel to people that have never heard before. That's called pioneering ministry there. That's pioneering pioneering missions, which, uh, you know, John Hatcher, he did a lot of that in Brazil, and we praise the Lord for all the works that he started. And just talking with him, I I said, John, how many works um, remain? And he gave me a number. I was astounded. I thought, wow, what an amazing work that you did in Brazil. Praise the Lord for him. Amen. And Paul is just like that, and that he went from place to place to place, and the place where Christ was not named yet, the gospel was not given, he would go and start a church. He would go over here, start a church, go over to Corinth, start a church. Right now, he's writing from Corinth, starting the church of Corinth. Uh, back in First and Second Corinthians, you see what they, they are like, and kind of night and day with the Thessalonians, <laughs> but he says, pray for us. Pray for us that when we preach... That the word of God will be used in a mighty way that people will get saved. It says, uh, the, the, the word of the Lord may have free course, may do its work, and be glorified even as it is with you. The way it was glorified with the church of, Thessalo- of the Thessalonians, that's not it, Thessalonians, uh, the r- way it was glorified is that they believed what God said to be true, and it changed their lives. It changed their lives. Paul, over and abundantly, he says, I am bound to give thanks for you because of how you have changed because you heard the gospel and it changed your life. And even though there's persecution all about you, you're still going strong. Praise the Lord. I am bound to give thanks. So he says, pray for us, number one, for the word of God may be effectual. And number two, not only that, but that of, of protection, number two, Verse number two, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. It's just an amazing thing to think about. The Apostle Paul and all the tribulations and trials he went through. Just amazing. In 2 Thessalonians chapter number 11, he, or 2 Corinthians, sorry, uh, chapter number 11, he runs through a whole 
discourse about all the things that happened to him, I just say, wow, any one of these things for, for any no normal person these days, they would stop. But if you look at it in, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, I'm going to start in verse number 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more often, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Thirty-nine stripes. He says five times. That's the maximum amount of uh, stripes that a person can have according to the law of Moses is 40. And so he says 39 or five times I got almost the maximum amount of punishment I should have gotten from the Jews. Whoa. And then he goes on to say, uh, let's see, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. And this is stoning with stones and not what people today would understand being stoned is. Um, thrice I, was, I shepherd, suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of, by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. But those, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So when he prays, hey, pray for protection because there's, there's wicked men and because not all men have faith. He's talking about these individuals that have hurt him, that have beaten him, that arrested him, that will say all manners of falsehood against Paul in his ministry. So with that in mind, think about it. All the people that we know in ministry, we ought to pray for. We pray for me. That I, I appreciate everybody's prayer, and I, I hold that very precious. And uh, anytime somebody prays for me, I almost get you know, teary-eyed saying, thank you so much. Uh, I really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, the more prayers, the better off I am, so that's good. Um, so think about it. People in ministry, we think about our missionaries. The, the letters on the board shows... People that are doing the Lord's work. We think of the missionaries that are among us, the Hatcher family. We should pray for them over and over abundantly. Especially when John, he's, he's almost 97. Amazing. 97, almost. End of this month. So praise the Lord for that. We should pray for those that we know that are in the ministry in the United States. Pray for Pastor Lupino and Nancy as they travel. They're right now in Indiana uh, doing some uh, missions work there. And... Uh, they have been doing uh, table talks where trying to get churches to do missionary care. And the more and more they can do that, the better off that we'll be as a, well, missions uh, sending a nation. And more and more our nation needs missionaries to be sent here. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so we should pray for those that we know that are in the ministry. We should pray for one another as we do the ministry together. And we praise the Lord for everybody that has a part in the ministry, whether it be music, whether it be a nursery, whether it be Sunday school, whether it be you know, cleaning the church. Everything is very much appreciated. Those who uh, can paint, it's appreciated, and do labors around the the church, those who mow the grass, very much appreciated. I, I don't want to mow the grass. <laughs> uh, with my allergies, imagine me trying to mow the grass out there. Ooh, that's terrible. But yeah, pray. Pray. If we know that Jesus is coming soon, we ought to pray and pray and pray and pray. But number two, not only that, turn back with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. If we know that the Lord is coming back. Number two, we ought to work like he's coming back. We ought to work like he's coming back. Notice with me what he says, verse number six. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, that's pretty serious. Like he, he says it right off. I am commanding you in no higher name that could ever be named but that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, this is a big deal. Big deal, Paul. 
And he says, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. You might say, well, what does that mean, disorderly? Read on. It's, it tells you what it is to be disorderly. Uh, in verse number 7, for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved our, not ourselves disorderly among you, so they weren't like this. Neither did we eat man's, any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. That's what disorderly means in this context. What it means for a person to be disorderly in the church in this context is that they refuse to work. They are refusing the work, thinking the Lord is coming, I don't need to work, I can just mooch off of everybody in the church. So, to work is a blessing. To work hard is a blessing. The very fact that we could do anything for the Lord is a blessing. As some people would say that in this generation especially, um, the work ethic is terrible. Absolutely terrible. And I've worked, worked at the hospital and I had many people that I was astonished at how bad their work ethic was. It was tremendously, it was terrible. Um, so it's uh, one of those things that this generation tries its best to find a job that will give them the most income that they can for the least amount of work. That's, that's kind of the motto for this generation that has come up. And now there are various examples of people that, that aren't like that, but there's a lot of examples of those who are. And so the work ethic is terrible, but praise the Lord for those who actually know how to work and do it. But here he's talking about, okay, there needs to be some sort of church discipline for those in the church that are, well, refusing to work even though they can. And so notice with me also in verse number 11, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. You know, if you don't work, a person can get bored very quickly. And if a person is able to work, now, let me, let me put this out. Uh, this is not referring to those who are retired. You know, it, it's understandable. We have a lot of retired people here, and that's great. That's great. You have worked, and now you no longer have to because you did retirement. You had a 401k. You had a, a IRA, a Roth IRA, all these fancy words. And uh, we have all the, the different wonders about if you worked a certain amount of time, then you can enjoy the, the fruit of your labor. And that, that's no problem with that. The problem is, if you can't support yourself and you have the ability to work, and in fact you should be working because of your age, then okay, there's a problem there. And what this is not referring to also, let me throw this out there, because there's a, many, uh, a bad perception about this, is uh, housewives, stay-at-home moms. Huh. If a person would begrudge against housewives or stay-at-home moms, <laughs> uh, you, they have no idea all the things that they do. They have no idea. Like, in order to com compensate my wife for all the things that she does, like I read this article, I would have to pay her a hundred and. $49,000 a year in order to compensate her for most of the things that she does. So where's the money at? <laughs> I know. Uh, no, it's uh, But all the things that a person does, that's work. That is work, especially with, with five kids. That's work. That's work. No matter how many kids, if it's one, if it's two, if it's three, five, twelve, you know, getting bigger and bigger. Charles, like, uh, Charles and John Wesley were two out of, I think it was 19 children in their family. Now, true enough, some of them, you know, there's a good percentage of them that didn't make it to adulthood, but still, 19 kids in one house. Woo! That's work. Susanna Wesley was an amazing individual. 
And so, praise the Lord for, for housewives. So that's not talking about those who work and don't, don't get an income because we can't pay you enough. Uh, but here is what it is, is a person that has the need to work, but yet refuses to work and expects other people to fund their uh, carelessness. And so he says, don't be party to that. Verse 12, now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So, in other words, if there are people in the church and there are people in this church uh, church of Thessalonica, they are wor- doing this. He says, okay, here's what you need to do. Read this letter and sh- tell them, Paul's not okay with what you're doing. And if they don't change, okay, church discipline. That's a nasty word in churches today. Oh, you don't do church discipline. Well, it's the purity of the church is at stake. If they're not doing what they ought to be doing, and it's a sin that's very grievous, it needs to be taken care of. It needs to be taken with the person and one, speaking one to another, two or three witnesses before the church, and if they refuse to change, they're out of the church. It's not bad. It's biblical. It's not, now, we're not, <laughs> you you didn't throw away your trash. You were out of the church. You know, we we, we got to see what biblically the reasons for church discipline is. It's not for every little nook and cranny that you ever have that, oh, I really don't like the nail polish that that lady had. Let's get her out. Uh, no, it's, it's something major that has church discipline attached to it. <clears throat> so we see that the need to work is now. Now, specifically, let's think about work as in working for the Lord. Now, there's one work of, okay, we're working our secular job in order to earn income so that we can, uh, uh, well, afford to survive, afford afford to live. But then think about it this way. Everything that we do should be to the honor and glory of God. If we have a job, then that job is to honor and glorify God. If we don't have a quote-unquote job, if it's housewife or or stay-at-home mom, everything you do is for the glory of God. For me, pastor, minister, everything I do is for the glory of God. So there's really no difference in that regard with everybody here. Everything that we do, that we find our hands to do, we should do it to the glory of God. So as we know that Jesus is coming back, and he is, we ought to do all things to give God the glory, to make God look tremendously great because he is. And to get as many people to come to Christ as we possibly can. So that's what we ought to do. So that's number two. That's number two. Number three. Number three. We should encourage ourselves daily in the Lord. We should encourage ourselves daily in the Lord. Notice with me in verse number three. It says, but the Lord is faithful. Amen. Anytime I I, I see that the Lord is faithful. I say, amen. He is faithful. He is faithful to every single person that he has promised you have eternal life if you put your faith in Christ. He's faithful. Uh, Remember that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Every time we do, he says, okay, you did what I told you to do. I'm faithful. I will forgive your sins. And so it's interesting. So he is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. He first acknowledges the very fact that they need the Lord and the Lord is faithful to do in them and through them what he wants to do. Praise the Lord. If it was up to me, I would be a miserable failure. But because God's in it, I have to succeed. (laughs) If I truly do the things that God wants me to do and I am submissive to his will, no one can stop me. That's a praise. God is faithful 
Amen. Not only that, but notice with me in verse number 16 now. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. This is a benediction that Paul has given the church of Thessalonica. Remember, this church is undergoing immense persecution in that they think that they are going through the tribulation. How much persecution, how much terrible things are going to go happen in the tribulation as you see in the book of Matthew in chapter number 24 that a lot of different things will be happening during the tribulation time and it's not a time that you would ever want to be on the planet earth because it's literally God's wrath on the planet earth as well as the people of earth doing all sorts of rebellion, all sorts of wickedness against his chosen people. No one wants to be here for the tribulation. Now, that's a, a nice thing that we know. Okay, pre-tribulational rapture. We know that we're out of here before that happens. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> but yet, the Thessalonians, they're enduring persecution. And he says, he's praying, may the Lord supply you peace, not out of the tribulation, but in the midst of the trials that you're going through. The hardships that you're enduring, may he give you the peace by all means. Isn't that something that we need during the storms of life? Peace. Love the fact that, you know, Christ, when he wakes up in the boat and there's a storm, he says, peace be still. And the winds and the waves have to obey him because he's the creator. So even in our own lives, we have trials, we have hardships. We have our type of tribulation, not the tribulation, but tribulations. But yeah, God is still the God of peace that can give you the peace even in the midst of those hardships. Amen. Praise the Lord. We should encourage ourselves in the Lord daily. Not only that, notice with me, the last part of verse 16, the Lord be with you all. It's an amazing thing to think about the Lord being with us. Like we are not just here by ourselves. The Lord is with us. He's not only with us, but he's in us through the Holy Spirit. As soon as a person puts their faith in Christ, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding, at least should be, in our lives each and every day. And it's just an amazing thing. We are never alone. We're alone, but never alone. Uh, there was one a film that was made by some Christians about uh, these ladies that were captured by the Native Americans in the earlier uh, colonial days of America. And they uh, went through some horrendous things, but yet they encouraged each other knowing the Lord's still with them. And the title of that movie is called Alone But Not Alone. The Lord is with us no matter what. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Even in the midst of hardship, even in the midst of turmoil, even in the midst of family disagreements, and that's going to happen. Even in times where, where, where people are not talking, the Lord is still with us. Praise the Lord. But not only that, we see in verse number eight or 17, notice this with me, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Remember, there was letters in Paul's name that was going to this church, and they were confused by what was happening, what he was saying in one letter and not the other letter. So he says, okay, this is what I am writing, so you know it's me. Whatever it is that he signed his name, this is how I write, and this is how I have signed, and this is how you know for sure this is from me. And so here we see that the Lord is, is, gives a sure word. We don't, have to, we don't have to wonder, oh, is this really the word of God? We know it's the word of God. Oh, is there missing books in the Bible? No, because it's all there. It's been preserved by the Holy Spirit, guided and directed by the Holy Spirit in church history to give us exactly the books that we have in our hands today. We don't have to wonder, is the book of Enoch, should that be in there? No, <laughs> because it's not. <laughs> Praise the Lord for a sure word. And not only they, that, but we have God's grace. Verse number 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.
by the grace of God that all of this is possible. God's grace is so infinite. God's grace is so amazing. It's just um, great to think about, about all the things that God has given us due to the fact that he is just good. The fact that he is just a giving God. And we get all of uh, the things that we have that we are boasting in because of grace. For by grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We praise the Lord for his amazing grace. So we should pray for those in the ministry, which includes all of us, really. Uh, we should work as the day approaches that Christ will come back. And number three, we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord, especially when hard times hit us. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for this night you have given us. We thank you for this last chapter of Thessalonians. We thank you so much for our study. And Father, may you help us as we, we see the day coming that Christ will soon return. Help us to be found faithful. Help us and our motive to be the, to hear the words, well done thou good and faithful servant. And Father, we thank you for the encouragement tonight, and may you bless each person here. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.